Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky here, and today I'm with Mike Zani. Mike, welcome. Oh, it's great to be here, Michael. So, Mike, uh, you are the CEO of the Predictive Index, a uh, talent optimization platform that helps businesses really build high-performing teams uh, and cultures. Uh, your clients include very well-known names like Nissan, DoorDash, Bain Capital, as well as many other businesses that nobody is or many people have not heard of. Uh, just you know, your your local companies that are doing cool things. Uh, and you have a new book that came out uh, or newish uh, called The Science of Dream Teams, How Talent Optimization Can Drive Engagement, Productivity and Happiness. Uh, I've been enjoying that book. So uh, very well done on that. Uh, so yeah, let's let's dive in, Mike. I want to take us back a little bit because you were the coach, I believe, 1996 for the U.S. Olympic sailing team. Uh, tell us, first of all, how did you get into the world of being an Olympic sailing coach? Well, I was an aspiring Olympic athlete in, 90, in the 92 Olympic Quadrennium, uh, trying to qualify uh, myself for the, for the Barcelona Olympics. And I really didn't like raising money to fund my sailing, which is what I had to do. I did not come from a family that was going to fund me to go sailing all around the world um, whimsically, uh, even if it was a great cause. So I, I decided to coach for the 96 quadrennium. And in, in doing so, I took a lot of what were my competitors and was able to organize training strategies so that we could, um, we could really optimize performance. And interestingly, so you're sitting in Canada, the classes that I coached, uh, there was a men and women's 470 division, and they did not compete against each other for a slot at the Olympics but they competed uh, just among female or male teams. So our ultimate training squad was the top Canadian male and female team and the top US male and female team. Mm -hmm. And I got to coach those four for in, in 1995 for the last year as a run-up. And we had this fantastic training group and it was really the performance, three out of those four teams qualified for the Olympics, which is why the US Olympic team asked me to come on board as a coach. Got you. When you look back at that experience, um, you know, being an Olympic coach, what did you learn during that experience that you think that still like stays with you today that, that you, you use on a regular basis? Yeah, I, I really think I kicked off the, my people centric journey then. And it was, it was the lesson about having to modify yourself as a coach to get through to each athlete, these athletes, super high performance, super passionate, um, so talented, but quirky you know, often. And in order to modify yourself, some people liked analogies, some people didn't, you know, some people liked very specific data, others liked a softer touch. And, you know, so as a coach to get mm -hmm. the most out of your athletes, how do you modify yourself so that they can be the best they can be? Not necessarily that it's easy on you. And I, I think yeah. that was a, a skill that you, you bring to management and leadership that, but I think I started learning that process back then. When you say, I mean, that, that's really interesting because I think a lot of companies, you know, big or small, they define their values, they get clear on, you know, their vision, they try and kind of in, instill this culture. Uh, and then they think about hiring or, you know, their, their team and, and team building and, and growth from the perspective of do, do, do people, do these people fit our culture, fit our values? And what you're saying is it's a little bit different, which is how do I maybe modify how I approach leadership or how I approach working with a team so that I, I'm almost meeting my, my team members wh where they are, because you, you're seeing that there's greatness inside of them. There's, there's something there that you want to, to benefit from and build with. Can you give some examples of maybe how you have modified your approach to, to work with specific people or how you've seen others, uh, other leaders modify their approach? Uh, I think that might be very interesting for people to hear. Yeah. I, I, you bring up a really good point. I think the culture, of an organization, the values, the social mores at those organizations, those are really guardrails for the modification. But for every manager, for every leader in the company, for anyone who has an important relationship, you know, ask yourself the question of how do I modify to get the most out of working, say Michael, you know, if, if you are my boss and I have to manage up to you to be effective, how do I get the most out of that relationship? You know, if you're someone who is an early starter and likes to plan and put everything on the table, 
even though I might be pressure prompted and want to come in late, but in earnest, I really have to modify myself so that you are on board with mm. my work product. So a simple way to do that is, so when I have introverted uh, individuals that, uh, that I'm working with, they like to, introverts typically like to think through things before you present a topic. So just pre-wiring an agenda, you know, so Michael, let's meet at two o'clock and we're going to talk about these three things. Even if I only do that a half an hour beforehand, I mean, hopefully it'd be more, but you'd appreciate the fact that you get to think through what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Now, especially in a power dynamic as the CEO, if, if I ask someone to meet, they always have time for me pretty much. Right. So I have to make sure that if you're in a power position, not to wield that power, because they're going to have time for you, but then you could have gotten more out of it. Like I am so impatient that if I want to talk to you, I will, you know, slide my proverbial chair back and just approach you and you'll probably make time for me. But that's not the way if you are introverted or patient that I, I got to pre-wire and I got to ask you to the, for permission to interrupt you when it's okay for you not when mm -hmm. it's okay for me. And it's little simple things that you can do. It's yeah, not no, massive I, mountains. I, I really love that. I think that, that's extremely powerful. I was going to ask you this later on, but I think it's an appropriate time now, which is kind of the, the power of vulnerability. And you talk about this in your book, um, you know, for many leaders, especially hard charging leaders, um, it's not always comfortable to accept or to, you know, expose vulnerabilities where do you see the power of, first of all, identifying, you know, where to be vulnerable? And then I'd love to get some examples of how you or others have taken that identification of something that maybe you're not great in or something that you need to expose and, and what you've done with it. Um, so that people can really kind of see, uh, see it uh, at work. Yeah, it's re it, the onus is on the leader to be the first person to be vulnerable. If you don't create a culture of vulnerability, people will not be open with the things that they're working on. Mm -hmm. you know, every, every human you know, is, is working on something. Some, some just don't know it. But the, the self-aware um, among us are actively working on, on things, which is, which is fantastic. But if, if the leader says, just kicks it off, I am working on these items. I want your help. And if you nudge me when you see me doing these things, which I'm not as proud of, or that I, I consider to be things that I'm working on, I would love your support, help, you know, nudging to get me back on track because I'm actively working on these things. If you can show that vulnerability, then when you approach them about the things that they need to be working on, their first move is probably not to be as defensive. And yeah. you, can, you can create this positive virtuous cycle where people are becoming self more self-aware together, asking each other about, Hey, when do I frustrate you, Michael? You know, what, what part, you know, or this, how did we get to this, you know, caustic discussion? And you can say, how, how do we back this up and, and be our own Monday morning quarterbacks so that we don't do that again? Cause we don't, m most of us don't want those tension filled moments. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's really the, I mean, it, the power is in the onus. The onus is on the leader to be the first to do it. So you, you've given us two really powerful principles. So modification is one. Uh, the second now being uh, around vulnerability. Is, is there another? Is there some other principle or kind of keyword that when you think about working with a team uh, is, is top of mind for you, or it's just like an integral part of, of how you operate? Well, I think if you if you have alignment on 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 the really strong mission vision uh, culture of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to accomplish it, you you brought it up in those are the guardrails for how you can modify. You know, if it's you know it, this is what this is what got Wells Fargo into trouble. It was win at all costs, and the culture um, of you know hit your numbers. And they started going astray. They, they, you know, they, they somehow convinced themselves, not all, that it was okay to create false accounts for people. Like that was a, that was a culture, mission, vision breach that they didn't have those guardrails in place. They didn't have mm -hmm. that, that, 
that North Star. Because I think, I think when you look at teams of people and high performing teams, the, the, the majority of the people are sort of working on themselves. They're open with each other. They're exploring ways to be better, but they have to make sure that they're doing the work the, 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 you know, they're, and they're aligned on what that work is. Mm-hmm. And if it's a junior team, it's work. If it's a senior team, it's, it's strategy vision, right. uh, which is why I sort of use those um, in, a, in a very, you know, very aligned. That, that, that's because it depends on the tenure of your team. A group of managers don't connect as much with, with the corporate strategy as they do with what their department's working on. Right. You took uh, fairly early in your career, uh, you took over a company in an industry that you didn't have much experience with. Um, just outline for everyone kind of joining us right now, what was that company and, and why did you buy it? Well, I think when you come uh, from the world of a sailing coach, almost every industry is, is new. So um, my business partner, uh, Daniel, and I, we, we adopted this, this business model called a search fund, which is the opportunity to buy a used company with other people's money. So, you know, we were snot-nosed uh, kids, you know, at 30, 34 and 32. I'm two years his senior. Um, we raised money from 10 high net worth individuals to, and we bought a company. And it was a little audacious, but, you know, the company was doing six and a half million in revenue, 45 employees. And, and it was in the rugged docking station space that mm. made, they enabled hardened computers to, to survive in cop cars, utility trucks, fire trucks, uh, military vehicles. And I mean, this was a niche, niche little space, um, not a bad business. And, you know, but we knew nothing about rugged computing. We knew nothing about vehicle dynamics, shock and vibration and temperature and all the struggles. We didn't know a lot about what, how, how do cops and utility workers work? Uh, how, do they, how do they stay productive? But we, you know, honestly, it took six months to get up to speed in an industry. I, I think people put too much weight on industry experience, really. Mm. So I'm very interested in that. Like, if you didn't have the advantage of understanding the the business, understanding the product. Like, what what did you see in that business? Uh, where where was the opportunity that you identified? Because you obviously to, to gather the investment to have that level of confidence. You know, you, you were I'm I'm putting maybe words in your mouth here, but I'm guessing that you were very confident that you could make this successful, grow revenue. What did you see? What was in that business that gave you the confidence to move forward? Daniel and I, my, my wife used to work for Bain Consulting. So when we were starting to look at businesses, we, you know, I, I went to my wife and I said, hey, does Bain have a framework for analyzing companies? And she says, yeah, they have two. One's a three column. Uh, the other is an eight column. I'm like, let's do the three column. That seems simpler. Yeah. So th- the three column framework was uh, marketplace attractiveness. One, two was competitive position within the market. And then three was value creation opportunities. So every company that Daniel and I analyzed, we, we use this pretty simple framework. And, and we looked at it and the marketplace being attractive for, you know, for police um, and utility, you know, like this was early 2000s, you know, computing was, was booming and productivity through adopting, you know, mobile uh, wireless you know, cops were no longer calling in dispatch to run a plate. They were run a plate themselves. So we looked at this and said, this marketplace is really attractive. They're going to be a lot more cop, you know, cops with computers, and they're going to need really solid equipment because we determined in our due diligence that if a computer went down, the cop and the cop car went down. You basically drove back to, you know, mm-hmm. my computer's broken. I can't do my job. Mm-hmm. So we thought it was a very attractive market. It was growing. And, and the company that we bought was pretty competitive. They were fifth in market share, but they landed New York City Police Department. Like, if they can land NYPD at the highest price point, there has to be something there. And then value creation. It was a long list. So like This company was run by two great founders, but they were not super sophisticated in how they approached 
their business. And we knew that there were a lot of value creation opportunities. Mm. I, I tell, I tell oh. a lot of lay, lay people, it's like buying and flipping houses, just, you know, slightly using a, a business lens as opposed to, wow, if I put a new kitchen and two new baths yeah. in, I'm going to make a lot. This is a five year typically right. project. And you're like, what, what rooms am I going to fix? <laughs> You, you mentioned in, in, in your book, Mike, that one of the things you really focused on was the team and the talent in that business. Um, what specifically did you do that within the, the landscape of team and, and talent in that organization? What, what did you do that had the biggest impact? Well, Michael, we missed the talent side so badly in due diligence. Mm. So, you know, when we, when we did that analysis, you know, marketplace attractiveness, competitive position, value creation, we did not identify, oh boy, this team is not the team that we need to execute this new, more aggressive strategy. So it took us about 18 months to two years to, to, to really get our footing at turning around the talent side of things. Mm. As, as a matter of fact, it was in our first company, Ledco, uh, that we ran into the predictive index as clients. And it was one of the tools that we adopted. But I, I tell people that first company was like getting a master's degree in human resources. Yeah. And, I, you know, Dan and I were lucky enough to go to Harvard Business School and they teach you a lot about strategy, a lot about finance, a lot about competitive position and marketing, but they don't teach you anything about how to build world-class teams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there are a lot of natural leaders who attend schools like that, but I don't think the books teach you how to do that. So we missed it. It was painful. We had to kind of build it from the ground up. And it was, it was sort of those, those lessons which said, wow, we really, and other CEOs really need to do a better job with respect to pulling the talent lever. And what, what did that look like more specifically? I mean, were you, did you essentially have to go in and let go of a lot of people? Uh, and then was it about finding uh, you know, people that had more experience in that industry or like when you look at all the different things that you did, what, what do you feel actually had the biggest impact on the growth of the business from a, a talent perspective? I, I want to give kind of listeners and viewers a little bit of a look inside, like what, what were the different chess pieces that you moved, right? That, that actually helped you to win the game. We, um, un unfortunately, um, only had four of the 45 people make it over the five years. So, you know, 90%, you know, turnover of that original team. And it, it didn't mean that all of those people, you know, some of them made it most of the way, but it was, we, we were trying to create a super high performing team where everyone in every role was a top 10% for that role, for that job, for that pay. And we, we sort of took that attitude. We were trying to play, you know, if, you know, major league baseball, we're trying to put a world-class team on the field and just really outrun our competition. And it, it, it worked sort of empirically. We went from 6 million in revenue to 35 million in revenue and, you know, went from fifth in market share to first in market share. Mm -hmm. But it, it was about really getting um, the right behavioral fit for each job, the right cognitive capability for the complexity of the role, as opposed to industry experience. Right. We were betting on raw, you know, you know, sort of the, the raw, actually today we use this, this, I didn't use this back then, but we use this head heart briefcase in the head is your, your behavioral traits, your cognitive capabilities and your heart, what gets you up in the morning, you know, what motivates you. And the briefcase is your experience. Everyone mm -hmm. over always overweights the briefcase. That's your resume. Mm -hmm. you know, what have you done? What industries have you done it in? Whereas we, we basically downplay the briefcase as much as possible and focus on head and heart and, you know, get with people who can really uh, run hard. Right. And, and, and I think we, we've done that now on four platform companies. And if, if, if I started a fifth platform, um, that's the first thing we would look at. How do we build a world-class team with head and heart? <laughs> As you were doing that, I mean, was there any challenge, any hesitation uh, in, in bringing in world-class people? I mean, it sounds like to bring in world-class people, your, your salaries potentially like expenses costs may have, may have ballooned. I don't know if you, if you did something 
to cut down on that. I just want to kind of dig a little bit into your mindset as you were making those decisions. Was it just about, okay, yeah, we have investor money. Uh, we know, we know that we're going to take a bit of a hit, but we need to bring these people in. Like what was the, the thought process and conversation and mindset that you had around making the investments into bringing really seasoned or, or high quality people in that potentially could have bumped up your expenses and costs for a period of time? Actually, when you, when you don't pay for experience, you can actually lower costs. Yeah. You know, experience, a, a heavy, going back to the, you know, head hard briefcase, a heavy briefcase is expensive. Mm. You know, if you have someone with 20 years of experience uh, in rugged computing, you know, they're going to, they're going to command, you know, a six figure salary that starts with a two and at least, and so we could actually lower, you know, our costs by going with, you know, head and heart, not briefcase, being right. willing, willing to train uh, and teach and cultivate and coach and develop the industry specific stuff. But I will say my philosophy on pay is you got to take it off the table. It has to be competitive enough that it's off the table as a decision-making criteria. And that's different for each person, each role. But if, if you take it off the table and you're, you're just in, in the ballpark that what you end up doing is you start having discussions about the more meaningful parts of why you're going to work here. Mm -hmm. Do you have a connection with our mission? You know, do you really want to work here? Would you be a good member of this team? You know, do you fit culturally here, ethically here? You know, are you someone who you can see, you know, when you're interviewing all of a sudden you're like, I could really learn from you. And I think not only could I learn from you, but you could learn here and develop your career that when people, when the conversation goes there, people and pays off the table, you, you've, you've got not only an employee, but you probably have an employee for, you know, many, many years mm -hmm. now pay, pay, you know, I, I would estimate that we pay 75th plus percentile, but we just don't burn investors money to, to, to overpay to just get someone who looks to be the best. Right. Got you. Yeah. That's a really interesting perspective. So, uh, so you build up that business, things went well, you, you later, uh, with investors purchased the predictive index from the family or the trust that, that owned it. Um, what, what were the first changes that you made when you came in and took over? I mean, there's this great platform for those that are familiar with pred predictive index in terms of like the data and the tools and the assessments. So a, a lot of value in the kind of intellectual property, but, but you now coming in again, you know, I don't know if you ran your three kind of quadrant, you know, Bain capital assessment on it, but, but what were the first things that, that you did in this, in this business that you had just taken over that had a long history? Well, as soon as you take a company over, you have to address all the me issues that happen. So there were, you know, mid thirties, number of employees at the company, and there were say there was 37 people, there were 37 different sets of me issues because everyone is thinking about what's, what does this mean to me? Mm -hmm. Do I get to see, keep my same office, my title, who am I reporting to? Is it going to be better or worse for me? And I, I really think in acquiring a company, the first thing you do is you address the me issues and then pull people in to what are you trying to do? And for the predictive index, it was, it was interesting because it's not often they take over a 60-year-old technology-based company. It was a science-based company. Mm -hmm. He said, our science is world-class, but our tech stack, how we deliver it, our software is not. Mm -hmm. So we need, to, we need to make sure we build the surround around the science to unlock its potential. And as people start... They, at, at first, people are like, what does that even mean? You know, you have to sort of really paint the picture of like, hey, we're, we're not going to be just this great science, which is delivered by humans, uh, which it is and was, but we want to we want to build software around it uh, to support it. Mm -hmm. um, so our consultants who work for us now, we have a network of, you know, over 700 certified partners that are mostly management and talent consultants that we, we really want, you know, this is the work that they do. They do consulting powered by software, powered mm -hmm. by a powerful data model. Mm -hmm. And 
before they used to just say, Hey, I'm a consultant who uses this great system, but they, they didn't, they didn't have that power of a software platform behind them. And it did a lot of the mundane work. Right. Um, How many consultants did you have, uh, or, or were there in the predictive index delivering, you know, the, the, the data and services and the assessments when you took over? There were 47, um, companies, probably about 180 to 100 active consultants who were really doing it. What would you day. say, I mean, was that one of the, the, the big areas or big ways that you've grown the business or have there been other ones that you'd say have even provided uh, greater growth in terms of changes that you've made? You know, I, the, the single most important thing that we've done is, is, is build a world-class network of, of consultants and partners. Because if you're trying to change people's minds about talent, our number one competitor is people doing nothing, mm -hmm. you know, just relying on their old talent strategies, which um, we could get into, but are, you know, unstructured interviewing, you know, with their own biases and managing the people the way they themselves want to be managed. So if you're trying to have a new discipline, change, think about a new way of doing things, a world of talent optimization that you can't just give someone a log into the software. You do need the guided tour by, you know, someone who is strategic, a mm -hmm. consultant to understand the company, what they're trying to achieve and help, help the client, you know, really build these muscles uh, mm -hmm. on being this new discipline. We couldn't do it without our certified partners. And it's probably the single most important element that we've done is, is, is start, you know, almost, uh, getting, getting the ball rolling. You know, at first, you know, we were able to add 20 partners after two years. And, you know, I think we, we, you know, we, we successfully added 250 partners last year. So right. you know, you're adding a zero to the, this, these, uh, these motions. What, what changed between when you were adding, you know, 20 verse 200, what, what have you, what are you doing differently now that you weren't doing then? Like, what have you identified that, that works better. I think it's 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 the it's the attitude of scalability. Mm, what does that if mean? Some, if something is not easy to do, how do you how do you make it easier to do? When we bought the company, we were not easy to do business with. Actually, even two years after we bought the company, we were still not easy to do business with. We still have more work to do. We we need to be even easier to do business with. So when a consultant has an aha saying, I like the way you talk about talent and strategy, mm -hmm. I would like to add a talent practice to my portfolio. And when they come to learn about how we work and how they can work with us, you know, we just have to take out all of the noise. So it's really easy for them to be the consultant that they want to be, add a talent practice. And it, while it's easier and it's more scalable. It's it, it's still not as easy as we want it to be. Right. So you mentioned the how important it is in terms of this this network of consultants that you have. Is there what or was there or maybe is there any other area or any other way that you looked at when you thought about how to grow the business? Any other channel that you were maybe considering, but but uh, for whatever reason you decide to focus more on the consultant channel. Well, in parallel, we're working on um, product led growth. What does that mean? And product-led growth, uh, it's really as a juxtaposition to sales and marketing-led growth. You know, most companies are sales and marketing-led. You market, you have a funnel, and salespeople, you know, address that funnel and try and move you to client status. Yeah. Product-led growth is having your product do more of that work for you. Mm -hmm. So if you build in what internally we call a buttery smooth product experience, that someone can try it at a, at a freemium level and say, interesting, that adds value to my life. I'd like to use that more often. Now, product-led growth is mostly, most of us realize product-led growth every day with our phone. Mm -hmm. You download an app, you give it 30 seconds. If it adds value to your life in 30 seconds, you keep using it. And some apps you give more time, but and then you might actually use it and say, well, I'll, I'll buy the premium package. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, this is invincible. I'm going to buy the super premium package. And, 
it, this is creep product led growth is creeping into the B2B side of things. Mm -hmm. And it's even creeping into consulting where you have to show people value right away, or they're not going to want to work with you. Right. Right. So you, I think one thing that uh, a lot of consultants feel in terms of assessments, uh, you know, whether it's Myers-Briggs predictive index or, or others is there's, there's a level of kind of comfort and confidence that yes, this data, like there's value in the data, but I think that at, at sometimes people question the, the accuracy or, you know, you'll do like, I've done it myself, you know, you do some sort, sort of a personality or some kind of an assessment and you look at it and, and even taking the, like answering the questions, like I answered as best as I could, but I still feel like a little bit uncomfortable about that answer because it just, it feels like I'm not saying exactly what I wanted to say. And then you get the results and you look at it and you go, yeah, there's, there's definitely some truth here, but I don't know about over here. How do you look at them? I mean, you've been part of thousands and thousands of, of tests. What, what do you say, what, you know, what would you say to a consultant who's thinking about uh, using this even for their own hiring or for working with their team? How should people think about these types of assessments and, and tools to get the most out of them? But my, my favorite part of this industry is that the majority of the industry are run by IO psychologists, industrial organizational psychologists, smartest people in the room by far, you know, PhDs, brilliant. They know more about psychology than I would, will ever know. But I, I think if, if psychologists are running businesses, what they do is they always err on the fidelity of the tool. Everything should be higher fidelity. If the tool has higher fidelity, things are better. Whereas business people don't run on highest fidelity. Mm -hmm. Business people actually don't want to know about the science. They want the science there. Just like we want the science to make our Teslas drive themselves, our airplanes fly on autopilot, and our vaccines to work. But we actually don't want to know about it. We just want it to work. Business people are right in that camp of, give me red light, green light, tell me yes or no, get me to a really simple response. So my, my thinking that the tool does not have to be 99.9997% accurate. It needs to be, like you said, sort of 90 plus percent accurate. Mm -hmm. And you, you need to use it across your entire organization. So you create these data models that work. I mean, Amazon, guessing at what you're going to like, probably with 60% accuracy. And you're like, wow, I, I, I did want that snowblower. Thank you for suggesting that. Um, or I just bought a snowblower. Would you like a snowblower cover? Yeah, I, I do. So th they're guessing with some level of accuracy. You need da these data models mm -hmm. to help you drive your learnings. If you don't have the data models driving your learnings, how do you build a better team? You need to build a better team over time. Mm. This, this, I made a bet this one didn't work. Let's learn from that and have these feedback loops. So the assessments you use should have the systems and data approach and be efficacious enough, um, what we call valid. Do they measure what they say they're gonna measure? Mm -hmm. are, they, are they good on a test, retest basis? And are they fair against uh, adverse impact with socioeconomic groups right. to make sure that you're not biasing against females, race, ethnicity. And when you have that, if the data models there, it like the Hogan assessment is a world-class assessment, but they only, you on, only use it on SVPs and above. So you can't, you, you can't actually build a data model on the whole organization until you and the reason they can't is it's too expensive on a per test basis and it takes 90 minutes. Right. You're, gotcha. you're not going to make that investment on the shop floor. Right. Yeah. Um, Mike, there's so much more that, that we could cover here. And I think probably that the best way for us to, to wrap up for today is to point people to where they can just dive into uh, what you guys are offering at the predictive index um, and just all of the, the research and, and content that you have. And as well, want to recommend that people check out your book, the signs of dream teams, if you are someone that has a team or is thinking about building a team, uh, there's a lot in this book to, to help you, uh, you know, with that journey and to do it in a really efficient and effective way. So just want to give a quick shout out for that, that book. But yeah, Mike, where's the, the one place that you'd recommend that people go to learn more about you and uh, the work you guys are doing at the Predictive Index? Well, if, if you go to dreamteams.io, 
which is a URL, dreamteams.io. You can actually take the predictive index assessment for yourself. You can take it for a team. You can learn about the book. Um, and, you know, great place to learn about the discipline of talent optimization. Uh, you know, you can also come go to predictiveindex.com to learn about our organization. The, the team has really done a fantastic job with content. So there's, there's a lot of free content uh, on, to learn about the disciplines of talent optimization and how to use it in your organization without us trying to sell you something. I think if we take the approach that if, if you become an evangelist for improving how people manage their talent, you know, there's, there's a lot of growth for everyone. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, Mike. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Michael, thank you so much.